An ousted superintendent takes his former district to federal court. We take a look at his case coming up on WCBI News at 6. WCBI News at 6 starts now. Thank you for joining us tonight. The son of the Knoxville County Sheriff has been shot in what police say is a, uh, a daytime drive-by shooting. Our Quentin Smith is in Macon. We're going to try to get to Quentin shortly, but here's what we know right now. The Macon Police Chief, Divine Beck, confirms that the victim is Roman Maddox. He was shot multiple times in the chest. Beck says he may have also been shot in the side. Now, the shooting happened earlier today on North Street at MLK Street in Macon. Maddox has been taken to Baptist Golden Triangle. Right now, we don't know his condition. Witnesses tell police the shooter was in a gray Chevrolet Malibu with a Tennessee license plate. The tag number on that vehicle is 7LO5MO. If you have any information on this crime, please contact the Macon Police Department or Crime Stoppers. Again, we do have a crew on the scene, our Quentin Smith. We hope to get a live report from him soon. In other news, Tupelo police are investigating an Alabama woman's death after they say she was hit by a car. Police were called to the 600 block of North Front Street around 9.30 last night. 42-year-old Brandy Oliver was pronounced dead at the scene. Lee County Coroner Carolyn Green says she was from Birmingham. Police say evidence reveals the victim was likely struck by a car. The driver fled the scene. If you have any information on this incident, call Tupelo Police or Crime Stoppers of Northeast Mississippi. Well, with this weekend set to be the busiest shopping weekend of the year and people visiting family for the holidays, there is sure to be a, a lot of traffic out there on the roads. Sergeant Derek Beckham with the Mississippi Highway Patrol says officers are not out to just simply write citations. Their primary concern, he says, is your safety. What we're mainly going to do is up our patrol, um, have all available manpower out that, that can be, uh, and just uh, patrolling the highways a little heavier than normal during the holiday season. Beckham says although officers are not looking for anything in particular, they have their eye on a few certain locations to patrol more heavily throughout this holiday travel period. Well, as the holiday travel season kick off, kicks off, scammers are gearing up to take advantage of unsuspecting motorists at the gas pump, but there are some steps you can take to protect your financial information. Our Riley Livingston joins us in the studio with more on that. Riley. Andrea, when you hit the road, the last thing you want to think about is someone stealing your personal information. But if you're not careful, it could happen when you stop at the gas pump. It's time to pack your bags, load up the car, and head out to visit loved ones. Somewhere on the road, you'll probably have to stop for gas. Before you swipe your card, there are some things you need to look out for. If, like, if you're going to a gas station, the, the first thing I would recommend, you know, is using a, a pump that's closer to the store, you know, that maybe the uh, cashiers could keep an eye on to keep people from putting, you know, made to tear them from putting them on there. I always tell people, and if I use one, what I do is I'll actually grab it and wiggle it because a lot of times, you know, it may be loose. Uh, or you may notice a different, a change in color between the actual skimmer and the surrounding part of it. And it's not just the card reader you have to worry about. Scammers are replacing the pin pads too. But now your phone may be able to help you spot the skimmers. There's also an app you can download on your phone. I think it's called a Card Skimmer Locator. And what that does is it operates off the Bluetooth on your phone. And some of the card skimmers will run off uh, Bluetooth low energy. And uh, what it is is it detects a certain code in there that your phone also uses for Bluetooth low energy, it'll pop up that it recognizes something in the area. Mark Austin says car skimmers are always on his mind when filling up his truck. Absolutely. I try to play cash anytime I go get gas anywhere. Uh, I've heard of it uh, happening to several individuals around here. I just sent my son in there to pay cash. So far, Winona hasn't experienced problems with card skimmers, and they hope to keep it that way. I know the uh, the owners of the gas stations here, they keep a pretty good check on them because I know, uh, I think there were some located about 15 miles south of here. and uh, But I, the people around here are pretty good about keeping an eye on the gas pump. Some gas stations are putting a special tape on the control panel and card reader. If the tape has been tampered with, it shows a special design to warn people. All right, Riley in the studio with some good information for us. Time now for a first look at our forecast. We'll turn things over to Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson to see what 
travel is going to look like out there weather-wise. Hopefully no major travel issues in our area right now, aside from the fact that it is a bit blustery and we do have some clouds out there, 42 in the city of Columbus and those winds continue from the northwest. But look at this, that line right there, the dark, that is the low cloudiness and we don't see it, that is the clear sky uh, regime coming our way. So half of us already seeing the clearing, especially west of the trace, farther east still with the clouds. So 30s and 40s right now, wind chills into the 30s. We will gradually cool things down to around 30 degrees tonight. There could be a little bit of fog later tonight once those winds subside. So a bit breezy now, but here's our Saturday into the mid 50s, developing sunshine, a pretty nice way to start the holiday weekend. Your full forecast is coming up. The Columbus Municipal School District and several school leaders are facing a civil lawsuit tonight. Former Superintendent Dr. Philip Hickman filed suit today against the school board. President Jason Spears and two board members, Josie Shoemake and Frederick Sparks. Our Scott Martin joins us live in the studio with the details on that lawsuit. Scott? Yeah, Andre, Dr. Hickman makes several claims of discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. He goes into extreme detail accusing President, Board President Jason Spears of racially attacking him. Now, in the complaint filed by Dr. Hickman, he alleges Spears told him that he'd never sent his kids to, quote, this all-black district. Hickman also names Josie Shoemake, accusing her of telling Hickman he acted too black in board meetings. Hickman also claims he was harassed by board member Frederick Sparks, so much so that he became ill and emotionally distressed. Now, you may remember back in February, board members voted to terminate Hickman's contract. Now, in March, Hickman attempted to appeal his termination, but the board told WCBI then there was enough evidence to uphold the board's decision to terminate him. Now, in the suit, Hickman is asking for compensation of lost wages in accordance of his contract, compensate emotional distress, and a public apology to restore his reputation. Now, he is representing himself in this case. Now, earlier this afternoon, I did speak with board president Jason Spears. He says he hasn't seen any paperwork and has this was the first time he's heard of this suit. Andrea, back to you. All right, of course, we'll continue to follow that situation. A state senator is under pressure to step down from his leadership position after being arrested a third time on drunk driving charges. Lieutenant Governor Tate Reeves is urging Terry Burton to relinquish his post as president pro tem of the Senate. Burton was charged with DUI second offense after a Wednesday night accident in Octobaha County. Burton issued a statement apologizing for causing, quote, embarrassment to friends, family, and colleagues after his Wednesday arrest. He also said he would consider seeking professional counseling. The president pro tem presides over the Senate when the lieutenant governor is unavailable. Burton was elected to the position by his fellow senators. Well, many questions continue following the recent arrest of Webster County Sheriff Tim Mitchell. One looming question surrounds the credibility of cases in which Mitchell has been involved. Many of them, many people rather, are wondering if cases will be reopened or tossed out altogether. Our Cash Matlock spoke with legal experts to find out what impact there could be. He joins us in the studio with that story. Cash? That's right, Andrea. Sheriff Mitchell has been charged with tampering with evidence and intimidating a witness, but local attorneys tell me this might not be enough to reevaluate the department's cases. I mean, on, on all kinds of levels, it's an unqualified disaster. I mean, it destroys public trust in, in law enforcement. Forrest Allgood is a former district attorney, and he is referring to the sheriff of Webster County's recent arrest. He says a case like this would be any district attorney's nightmare. Obviously, the first thing you'd have to do is sit down and figure out which cases the man had a hand in and which ones he didn't. Defense attorney Kerry Jordan, on the other hand, thinks it may be harder to throw out the sheriff's cases. It's not an automatic toss out because the sheriff of Webster County has been indicted, but obviously, if he played a role, if a witness was encouraged or discouraged in a specific way that wasn't factual, you know, obviously those things would play a role. However, she says if it were her client, she'd examine every detail. He is charged with attempting to intimidate a witness. So I would want to know, has that gone on in other cases? So, so that is one area that does very much concern me. There's also a looming concern for the credibility of the entire department. There's a residual effect that this leads. It, it puts in people's minds the notion that all officers are bad and all officers are tainted. Well, it's a black eye. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It, it's going to take some real work.
to restore confidence. So it's not the death nail for the sheriff's department, but they're going to have to work hard to get the confidence of the people back. Allgood says electing a new sheriff will help relieve some of the tension in the community. When the, the boss, so to speak, changes, the culture changes. It would be unfair to say that the next man that comes in as sheriff is, is tainted also. Now, is he going to have to deal with a legacy? Yeah, he's going to have to deal with a legacy. But it's nothing that he can't live down. Allgood also said he's seen cases in the past that involved tainted witnesses, and those cases had to be thrown out. All right, Cash in our studio with that story. All right, we'll be we coming back. A look at some good news and some bad news for Mississippi's economy. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Thousands of federal workers are facing an uncertain holiday and new year as a spending bill grinds to a halt in Congress, possibly forcing a government shutdown. That includes more than 25,000 federal workers right here in Mississippi. Some, like park rangers on the Natchez Trace, will be required to work even though they won't see a paycheck. Others will be furloughed, basically at home until the partial shutdown ends, but again, without a paycheck. There are nearly 18,000 federal civilian workers in the state. This includes Columbus Air Force Base employees, air traffic controllers, and TSA. The rest are active duty military who work with all branches of service. In Alabama, a lack of government funding could affect more than 53,000 people. 38,000 of those are civilians. The shutdown could come shortly after midnight if the Senate and the House don't agree on a funding bill. Well, the news is better for the private sector here in Mississippi. Nearly a thousand jobs are coming to the Magnolia State. Online retail giant Amazon announced today it's bringing 850 jobs by adding its first fulfillment center in Marshall County. Employees at the center will pick, pack, and ship household consumer goods. Minimum wage for the center will start out at $15 an hour. It's unclear right now when the center is expected to be up and running. Interested candidates can learn more by going over to our website. WCBI.com. We'll have a look at your full forecast when we come back. Your WCBI First Alert AccuWeather Forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. Christmas weekend is here. It has finally arrived. Fairly tame overall. Seasonable temperatures, a few rain showers Sunday, maybe even on Christmas Day. If you're looking for snow, keep on looking around here. We have a zero percent chance of a white Christmas in our neck of the woods. No surprise, the best snow potential is always to our north on Christmas Day, and that will be the case this year. Now, what is Santa up to? Already stuck in the chimney. Speaking of the tempters, we're looking at 54 on Monday, Christmas Eve day. 36, fairly okay for Santa to fly on in on Monday night. And for Christmas Day, a chance for a few showers, upper 50s to around 60. So that's the way it's looking. We do have a 30% chance of rain Sunday morning. There's that minuscule rain chance Tuesday and Wednesday. The next best rain or storm opportunity next Thursday into next Friday. So that's where we are headed for the next seven days. Right now, a live view from downtown Louisville, Mississippi. We are scouring out those clouds. It has been a persistent gloom all day long. And you can see it right here. Andre, there are the black clouds. See? You always are hating on that black cloud we put on the 7 day. Well, that's uh, the way it looks here on the map. Uh, we thin things out nicely back to the west, and things will be improving for every location here as we go throughout the course of the evening. Notice that mostly sunny for our Saturday. Can't rule out a little bit of patchy fog later tonight once the wind subsides, but right now, no concerns. Mid 30s to the low 40s right now, down to around 30 degrees tonight. And for your Saturday, back up into the mid 50s in many spots. Southerly breezes tomorrow at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. So our Saturday, not too bad. This is a pretty nice way to kick off the long holiday weekend. If, if some of you actually have a long holiday weekend, you can uh, enjoy your Saturday, last second holiday shopping, what have you, or travel around the region. It's looking pretty good here for the first day of the weekend. So if you're going to the southwest tomorrow, warmer 60s to low 70s, cooler, but still pretty decent back to the northeast. Here's the big picture. We have a chance for a few showers with that frontal boundary right there on Sunday. Quiet with high pressure on Monday. And we'll start to see some southerly flow return on Tuesday. Can't rule out some showers in there, but as we get into the uh, latter part of the upcoming work week, as you can see with your active weather 70, a better chance for some showers and storms with some warmer 60s by the middle to end of next week. Sports is next. Stay tuned.
WCBI Sports is brought to you by your local Ford dealers. Go further. The Mississippi State women's basketball team got back on track the other night. Well, excuse me, with a huge win on Thursday night at Washington with a 103 to 56 victory after losing Tuesday night at Oregon. The Hell State Hoops squad improved to 11 and 1 on the season after the win. WCBI's Blair Schaefer was there, and she has more with the Bulldogs. The Mississippi State women's basketball team defeated Washington 103 to 56 Thursday night in the Alaska Airlines Arena. From the tip, the Bulldogs applied defensive pressure, leading to back-to-back -back scoring opportunities, forcing Washington to take a quick timeout after only three possessions. Leading the way for the Bulldogs was Jordan Danbury with a career-high 20 points and four steals. She was one of five Bulldogs in double figures, helping Mississippi State break an arena record for opposing points. Scored. Coach Vic Schaefer said he talked to his team before the game about responding. He wanted to know how they were going to respond from the Oregon game, and he said that his kids did just that tonight. When it was time to play, I think we need to be ready to play. You got to answer the bell, you got to punch first, and we've always taken great pride in that. So uh, I thought, again, you're coming into somebody else's house and playing on their, on their court. You need to let them know you're here and you're here to play the way we, we're going to play the game. And I thought we did tonight. The Bulldogs will close out their preseason non conference schedule on December 30th as they take on Louisiana Lafayette at home. But for now, reporting from Washington, Blair Schaefer, WCBI Sports. All right, thank you, Blair. Multiple high school basketball tournaments are taking place this weekend during the Christmas holidays. One of our area teams is looking to remain unbeaten today in the Amory Hoops shootout with Santa Classic. To the game, Nettleton boys facing Pontotoc. Early on, it's Caleb Hobson with the steal, and he would go coast to coast and finish it off with the right hand for two. Pontotoc up. Later on, Graham Gardner here for Nettleton. He would drive, and he would kick it out to Dedrick Johnson. He would back to Graham for three, and that would give Nettleton to tie the game there. Second quarter, Pontotoc up. It's Rock Robinson finally Cortland Armstrong for the transition three to extend the lead. Nettleton responds. It's Sean Pounds here coming up, and he would do look at behind the pass there and behind the back move with the scoop and layup finish, but it's not enough as Nettleton falls 70-52 to to lose their first game on the season. Staying in Amory now, it's Smithville girls facing Itawamba HS. Early on for Itawamba, it's excuse me, Heather Mobley. She would score for two off the offensive rebound. Later on in the first, Orlandria Smith gets a steal, and she would score the layup here, coming down the other end, going coast to coast. Now it's Itawamba's ball here. Quandre Lee with a dime to Madison Robinson for the baseline. Jay here coming up, and she would hit for there for two. Later on in the first, it's. Back comes Smithville here. There's Santa Claus enjoying taking in some hoops. It's Smith again, or Eurostep, and she would go in and rebound and finish with the one hand there for two. But Smithville girls are going to get the win, 43-31 to 31 over Itawamba. Now, over to Columbus. It is West Lounge taking off against Minor. Early on here in the Joe Horn Classic, Marshy Cecile's. Goes coast to coast and banks it off the glass for two. Second quarter, Lady Panthers here down 18 to 7. Off the inbounds pass from Avery Sanders back to Seals in the corner. She drains the triple. Trim leads back to single digits. Later on, Miners Maya Pauling gets the steal here, and she would go coast to coast at the other end and finish off for two. Miner gets the win 53 to 41 over West Lowndes. That is it for sports. Keith Gibson will have your last look at your forecast when we come back after this. All right, some 50s for this weekend. A good chunk of the holiday weekend. A few morning showers on Sunday. Sunday afternoon should be okay. Okay. For your Christmas Day, there also could be a little bit of rain in there. But the big rain opportunity will wait until after the holiday weekend. Well, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, how about that? All right, be nice out there to each other if you're doing that last-minute shopping. Patience, yes. everybody. That's the news at 6. Enjoy the rest of your Friday evening.